Hey everybody, this is Matt and we're at Texas Toast Guitars. Thanks for watching. The other day during a live stream there was a young man who wanted to know a little bit more about multi-lamination necks and multi-piece construction, multi-lamb necks, um, uh, equal opposite book match, two-piece, three-piece, five-piece necks, uh, scarf joints and stuff like that and I thought that would be a great video to, to do rather than uh, just talk about in a live stream. Um, so if you are watching, my friend, I wasn't trying to, to avoid you. Actually, you know how sometimes live streams go. I get to talking and I get to missing stuff. So I'm sorry that I missed your comment during the live stream. To make it up to you, I thought we would do a video today about multi-laminate neck construction. So why would you want multiple lamination necks? Well, uh, for one thing, it looks pretty cool. Um, you know, back in the day, back in the 70s, uh, companies like Alembic and BC Rich kind of pioneered this. There was lots of guys doing it, but those guys just kind of come to my mind. I'm sure you have lots of examples too. Um, a guy who I worked with for a long, long time, uh, a long, long time ago, uh, Bruce Clay at Rare Bird Guitars really liked multiple laminate neck construction. And we did a lot of that. Um, but uh, so that, that one reason would be because it looks cool. And frankly, that's reason enough if you ask me. There are some structural reasons too, and let's get into that. Um, back in the 50s, uh, I guess guitar wood was easier to get, or there were less restrictions on that kind of stuff, and um, there were more trees, and nobody really cared as much about saving the environment, so uh, wood cutting and milling, specifically quarter sawing, was done, it wasn't that big of a deal to do with woods that are basically considered magical right now. Um, so what you would want to do is you want to have a neck blank that's thick enough to get your uh, your headstock um, cut out of the out of the same piece. So you'd need to have something that was really tall this way, um, and you would want the grain to be oriented vertically. And um, the the way that you ensure that you get vertically oriented grain every time is with a method of milling called quarter sawing. Now. I've done a bunch of videos about quarter sawing, wood milling, flat sawing, rift sawing, um, uh, vertical grain versus quarter sawing. You can look all that stuff up. But for the for the sake of this video, let's let's keep let's brevity is going to be important here. So you want the grain um, ideally you want the grain to be going vertically on your your neck blank, and then the fretboard would go on this side here. This is a piece of. Um, white limba from my secret stash of white limba. This is eight quarter material, which means that it was two inches uh, before it was milled. Um, now it's probably like one and seven eighths because it's just rough milled, but eight quarter or two inches. Now at Gibson, because their headstocks are 14 to 17 degrees, this would not be big enough to have a quarter sawn grain orientation or a vertical grain orientation and have that very, very angled headstock. One of the reasons that we chose to go with a seven degree headstock on our necks is the neck blanks can be eight quarter and we don't have to get 12 quarter or 10 quarter to, to make up for the, uh, the, the headstock angle. So, so this will one day become a really, really nice one piece vertically oriented um, neck blank and it's from my secret stash of white limba and there are very very few of those that are going to be left so if you get one you're cool um, but here's a piece of uh, this is a vertical grain piece of mahogany and um, as you can see it's already got the neck the neck blank is drawn on it I'm just letting it kind of sit it's going to eventually be a, uh, a challenger neck blank one day so but just regular old mahogany and this is this is the same thing um, as the white limba Fender necks generally are um, uh, quite a bit thinner because the headstocks don't have an angle as much as they have a scoop. And um, so Fender can get away with four quarter, usually it's probably five quarter, and then a fretboard would get glued onto it. But if you get really, really nice material, you can get away with four quarter. This is a neck blank that I got from my friend Dan at Guitar Wood Experts. And uh, let him know if you're looking for a neck blank, he can hook you up. Um, so you can buy quarter sawn maple that's four and five quarter, but the majority of the maple that you get these days is um, is not quarter sawn. It is flat sawn, 
So again, guys, you're going to have to kind of do some digging to figure out what, if you don't know the difference between flat sawn, quarter sawn, vertical grain, um, that sort of thing. There's a lot of information out there. Some of it's even mine. But for the sake of this video, we want to get down to the meat and potatoes, right? Some standout companies who started using multiple lamination because vertically oriented grain was getting harder and harder to find was a um, uh, company that jumps to mind immediately is Hamer Guitars with a thing that they had called the stressed neck. And what that was was... Um, uh, that was a three-piece construction of flat sawn lumber that normally the fretboard would be here. What they did was they upended it like this and glued three pieces together and put the fretboard here. That way, the, the grain was all vertically oriented to the fretboard, and um, it was a way to ensure that um, they had a, a very structurally sturdy neck. You probably heard Paul Reed Smith and other guys talk about how dry wood is way more important um, when it comes to building guitars, absolutely perfectly right. And you can imagine that it is harder to get dry all the way through 8 quarter or 12 quarter material than it is to get dry all the way through 4 or 5 quarter because it's just so much smaller. Um, that's what makes my secret stash of white limba so cool is it's so dry. Um, I've had it in my possession for a long, long time, and I know where it was before that. It's way on dry. Um, but if you can't find super dry eight quarter, if you know if you don't have a secret stash of white limba, what if you were able to get some very dry uh, four quarter and glue it up? That's another great reason to do multiple lamination neck. Um, finally, there, I mean, there's lots of reasons to do this, but finally, one of the other things you could do is you could buy eight quarter flats on and just glue two pieces together um, and then you would have you know you'd have vertically oriented grain another cool thing that you could do is you could buy a big chunk of it cut it in half flip one of the boards and what we call an equal opposite book match and we've talked about that on the, the in the videos before um, essentially let's say that you were gonna cut this board in half and you're gonna flip one of the pieces and then glue it back together um, what that would give you potentially is a more stable material that as, say for example, if this board wanted to relax going down and to the right uh, and you glued it to another piece that was oriented such that it wanted to relax up and to the left, they would kind of counteract each other. That's the whole equal opposite book match thing. Remember, a lot of people say if you get a board that wants to warp or twist down and to the right, you can glue it to itself and it'll twist and don't, no, 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 no. Don't mistake relaxing and warping and twisting, okay? If you've got a board that's warping and twisting, it's not going to be awesome for a neck, okay? So there's a big difference between wood kind of relaxing and doing its thing and what it wants to do. And sometimes that's twisting and warping, um, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just like, ah, I kind of want to tweak myself this way a little bit. Um, that's relaxing. It's very different from warping and twisting. Okay, all right, let's move all this junk out of the way here. Actually, this isn't junk, this is good stuff. Okay, so in today's video, we are going to make a five-piece laminate neck that will work with our um, uh, neck blanks here. They need to be about 30 inches long by about mm, three and a half inches wide, and final dimension needs to be one and a half inches thick. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna cheat a little bit above all of those dimensions so we can mill down to size. The wood that we're going to use, I've got this piece of flame maple here. We're going to use that. Uh, I got this chunk of um, walnut, which is pretty nice. And then I have a piece of this maple here. Eh, oh, I didn't even see that. Maybe we shouldn't use this. That's looking kind of kind of hairy. Um, although maybe we can cut that chunk. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, and uh, this this will be this will be a hunk of wood that you know what we will we'll, we'll end up using this. So I guess that's another reason to use um, uh, multiple laminate neck construction is stuff like this can kind of get hacked away and uh, the, the piece of wood is usable. So if you've got a good deal on some material, um, that maybe this technique will work for you. So we're going to glue up a piece that's about thirty inches long, three and a half inches wide. Um, by three and a half inches tall and that should yield two nice neck blanks 
that look a little bit like this, only shorter. So let's jump in, guys. Enough with the bullshit talk. Let's get to work. All right, so all of the wood is now really rough milled out. Um, this chunk of maple here is gonna be my center piece. And uh, this chunk of maple and this chunk of maple here will both go on the outside of the neck. Uh, and then I'm gonna cut this walnut chunk down to go uh, on either side of this middle piece. So we're gonna have maple, walnut, maple, walnut again, <laughs> and more maple on the end. But I want to have this piece here, the center section, and this piece here, the two pieces that we're going to cut from this walnut, be the same thickness. And I want them to be fairly thin, like probably just under um, a quarter of an inch. So I'm going to set my saw up to resaw this piece and this piece, and then we'll smooth them out. All right, now you can start to get an idea of what the blank is going to look like. We've got thicker maple on the outsides with um, uh, thinner pieces of walnut maple and another hunk of walnut, and this will be the fretboard side. Remember that um, bogus knot that we didn't want to use? It's right here. This might be okay for a fretboard one day down the line. I don't know. We'll see. So I want these inner pieces to be quite a bit thinner. In fact, I want them to be less than three quarters of an inch when they're all, when they're all smushed together, just the center section. So um, obviously we can't glue it up right like it is because there's saw curves and stuff and it would look like a mess of glue. Um, so we're going to get everything nice and smooth and, um, and thin these guys down to the right thickness. And uh, we'll do that over at the joiner uh, if we need to, we, we might not need to, um, thickness planer and the thickness sander. Hell, we might even just jump right into the thickness sander because it's such a cool tool. Okay, so our multiple laminations are all done. Everything's nice and flat and smooth and ready for glue up. Now, it's quite a bit thinner than, uh, than you might have been thinking it was going to be. And uh, it is just barely wide enough, thinner, wider. It's just barely the right size to work with our neck template, which is right at two and a quarter. And this is right at two and five sixteenths. So there's a 30 second on either side back here. We'll have to just get really, really close when we do it. Now, the other thing you'll notice is the headstock end is clearly not um, wide enough to do a, um, a three on a side like, I mean, it's really close. So we'll have to add some more bits, but it's already multiple lamination, so I'm not gonna sweat that. It's already gonna have a bunch of stuff to it. So um, now is the time that we need to glue this bad dude up. Um, I know what someone out there is, is saying as they're watching this video. Well, that's all fine and good, but what do I do if I don't have a joiner and a planer and a thickness sander and a bandsaw and, you know, how do I do it with no tools at all? The short answer is you don't. You, you know, you've got to have some tools. Um, I'm sure that you could use a hand plane and card scrapers and, 
and all that stuff. Um, and you could probably get excellent, excellent results with it if you're very, very skilled with those tools. But the fact of the matter is, guys, if you want to do a bunch of these, or if you want to do, um, if you want to do them quickly, you're gonna need to add electricity to, to the arrangement. I'm sorry that that's the way it works out, but I, I don't know what to tell y'all. Um, like I've said in many, many videos before, you don't necessarily have to own all of these tools to have access to all of these tools. There's lots of places that, um, uh, you know, that like with wood shops and things like that, at schools that you can take classes and you can use these things, or, um, you know, like shared spaces. If you live in a big city, there's probably a woodworking shared space. Um, if you if you really want to get creative and you're really personable and you have a 12 pack of beer on Friday at 430 and you go to a very, very small woodworking shop in your area, don't be surprised what you could get away with um, if you're in the right place at the right time with the, with the right thing. Um, don't go to your local woodworking shop on Monday morning at eight o'clock and expect to get the same results as you would on Friday you know, at, at right before closing time. Um, make friends with some of those guys and, uh, and they will, uh, don't be surprised if you can have access to some neat, neat stuff that you don't have to buy, okay? Um, be creative and you'll figure it out. All right, glue up time. Everything's ready to go and I put some X's on my blank so that I would know how to put everything back together. <laughs> and I've got a bunch of clamps laid out. Um, I got my glue here and I got some paper put down, so that's good. I'm just going to go ahead and lay this out so that um, the sides that are facing up are the sides that get glue. And this one will go over here for now. I need to lay out a bunch of glue and I need to wipe it on pretty fast, so I got just a piece of cardboard here that's going to help me um, help me do that. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and put my set my glue up here to really dump a bunch of glue and hopefully that will be enough we're gonna smear it on everything and I realize that there are lots of ways to do this so if your dad does it a different way I'm not saying that he's wrong I'm just saying this is how I do it so we want to make sure we have enough glue. You know what I mean? We get everything nice and covered with glue. Act right now, walnut. Okay, we got some on the ends here that for some reason they don't want to get all glued up. We're gonna make them get glued. We might need to switch to a more, a more precise tool but maybe not let's see i'm gonna get some in these areas that are being problematic there we go so when it's hot guys you know this you really have to work hard well you have to work fast anyway to get your glue spread out so if you're working with a bunch of laminates like we're doing here move with haste all right Let's see, now we should be able to just, glad I put this paper down. Yeah, all right. Okay. Now I got glue all over my fingers. It has been said to me that you can put salt on glue to keep it from moving around. I have never done that. If you know if that's true, let me know. Okay, I'm gonna put this in a clamp down here and clamp it together that way. That looks pretty good. And it looks like we got some stuff kind of wanting to, kind of wanting to wiggle around a little bit. But we made it oversized, so we're not gonna trip too much. Right. All right. Now, obviously, that's not enough clamps, but um, I wanted to get everything kind of fixed in place so that um, so that I knew we were looking good before I moved to the real clamps. 
Okay, I'm going to use these, these bar clamps because I like them and because they put a lot of pressure on the piece. And once I get these guys in position, I'm going to remove all the other ones. Oh yeah, there we go. Now it's just a simple matter of flipping the whole shooting match over. <laughs> okay. All right, now let's get all these clamps doing what they need to do and looking how they need to look. There we go. You guys are doing, you guys are doing super. Good job, clamps. Clamp Jed. Okay, and just like that, we are all clamped up. All right, so that should wrap up how you make a multiple laminate neck. Uh, you know, sometimes I say you don't need to let stuff sit in clamps overnight. There's so much glue here going on. I'm going to go ahead and leave this one sit overnight, mostly because I'm not going to do a whole lot more with clamps later today. So I don't need to have access to all these clamps, and I don't need to have access to this bench. Just go ahead and leave it sit and it will, uh, it'll, be, it'll be fine. We'll come back in in a day or two and we'll plane uh, the, the top here. We'll run it over the joiner and we'll have a nice perfect spot to um, attach our fretboard to after we do stuff like truss rod and junk like that. But that's how you do it. Um, so uh, let's, let's move forward with the video and we'll talk a little bit more about some, uh, some other things that I think kind of keep coming up when we're talking about multiple laminate necks. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed the part of the video where we actually made uh, a multiple laminate neck. This is not TV magic. This actually is, it's not the neck that is in clamps back there. Um, this is one that I did recently and um, it's just left over. But the neck that we have, um, the, the blank that we, that we built will look a lot like this when it comes out of clamps. So, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of companies that use multiple laminate construction. You don't have to have, um, you know, uh, alternating uh, color pieces. This is an Ibanez neck, and as you can see, you can probably really tell at the heel there how there's three pieces of material. Um, here's another one, another Ibanez neck, same deal. You can see how the pieces are oriented, and you can see that the grain is more or less vertical in relation to the, um, to the fretboard. Uh, I, I thought that maybe these necks would have a scarf joint, but they, they don't. I don't have any necks with a scarf joint hanging around the, um, the shop right now. And that's a question that comes up a lot. People go, well, what about scarf joints? How do you do one? Do you use them? Et cetera, et cetera. So what a scarf joint is, is you would have a blank like this and you cut it at an angle. Let's say you're using a 14 degree headstock. You'd cut a 14 degree angle and you'd flip the other piece so that you had a Yes, you had a headstock that was angled. Now you can have, there's lots of different ways to do scarf joints and um, uh, they all work really well. I used to use scarf joints on almost everything and I really liked them. Then I discovered using a dramatically less headstock angle and I, I like that so much better than scarf joints that I just use that now. Um, so yeah, you use a little more wood and you waste a little more material, but you save some time, and uh, and I think that that has has benefits too. So um, further into that end, I even if I did a scarf joint neck, I would still want to go with the seven degree headstock because I like it so much. So if that were the case, the scarf joint would come way way back here, and it would it just it just you need to use a I think you ought to use a. Um, uh, a more aggressive angle on your headstock if you're going to use a scarf joint aesthetically. That's just me, you know, says me. Your mileage may vary. Um, could you do a scarf joint with uh, a, a piece of material like this? Yeah, you could. And it, it, if you did it right, it could really look cool. You know what I mean? You could have, you could have the, the, the pieces kind of flow from one to the other. Um, remember that guy I was talking about, Bruce Clay from Rarebird? He used to do this thing where he would take two different laid up things and have so like the scarf joint would have like a different 
color combination it was wild and and yeah so that that's a cool way to go um, so I'm not I'm not opposed to using scarf joints I just don't use them anymore so um, so yeah scarf joints are, are, are a cool thing and you should at least know how to use or how to make a scarf joint I'm trying to block the light there you should at least know how to do a scarf joint in case you have a customer that wants or in case you decide yeah I really like these things um, so anyway that's that's how I feel but that should just about do it for today let's go ahead and wrap this video up guys if you have any questions about what we did in the shop today or uh, any questions about any of the tools that we use or any of the materials anything about uh, grain orientation there's lots of videos but if you have those questions please leave them in the comment section section below and I try to answer as many of those as I can I read all the comments even the ones that say hey Matt why are you such a loud mouth I, I love those um, I don't love those. This is the way I talk, you guys. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm sure I'll get flooded with those. Um, and Wonder Bread guitars and shit like that. <laughs> so uh, leave them all in the, in the comment section below. I read all of that stuff. Um, if you appreciate content like this, you might want to go over to our Patreon page and become a member. Even a buck a month goes a long way to helping us bring you guys neat stuff like this. Um, if you can't do Patreon, though, we totally get it. Just... Watch all the videos, like all the videos, share all the videos as many places as you can. And don't forget to log into our Sunday, uh, Sunday evening live stream. It happens every Friday or every Sunday rather at five o'clock mountain time. And um, uh, it's always a lot of fun. And sometimes I'll even answer your questions about stuff like this. Uh, let's see. Oh, swag. Guys, if you want to uh, get a Texas Toast t-shirt, links in the description below. Uh, people have been asking me about that stuff. So. Let's go ahead and wrap it up, guys. This is Matt at Texas Toast reminding you, if you're so smart, build it yourself. That's what I do. Thanks for watching, y'all.